Blessings, everyone. Thank you for joining me today. And it's a special honor to have Father Moses McPherson here. I first became aware of Father through his Twitter account because Father um, sometimes posts live Twitter feeds, correct, Father, on your Twitter account? Yeah, we do uh, an ancient, ancient uh, knucklehead radio sometimes. That's it, that's it, that's it. Thank you, yes. So one time I was um, listening to Father on his uh, uh, Twitter account, and he had mentioned... Um, so it wasn't the focus of your your talk, but you'd mentioned some issues of, of fatherhood and fatherlessness and and um, uh, fathers in uh, terms of uh, the men growing up and and uh, boys and stuff. And that's always been something that I've been really interested in. So I started corresponding with Father through Twitter, and then I asked Father if he would. Um, here on my podcast and he said yes so thank you father yeah yeah my joy my joy thank you and and father you're in you're in texas yeah so i'm just north of austin georgetown okay. texas okay so yeah we have a church here called holy mother of god orthodox church we're with rocor uh diocese of the midwest and archbishop peter and uh we have uh our church is dedicated to the hawaiian uh, mer streaming icon of the mother of god oh wow yeah, that, we're te technically we're the first row core church to ever uh, be dedicated to the icon. Wow. Yeah. The, the there is the the I don't understand quite I'm not quite clear father, but I guess there's a there's a pilgrimage icon of that that travels cuz it was at the cathedral in San Francisco a couple months ago and I saw it. So that's not the original icon, is that like a traveling well, so there's the there's the original Aviron icon, which right. is on Mount Athos, which oh, okay. is uh, okay. Portaisia, the keeper of the portal. Okay. Uh, it's the original. And then there was a that's what they you know call uh well, it's the original. And then they they without getting into all the details, there was a man named Brother Jose. Yeah, he yeah, was yeah. on Mount Athos, and when he was traveling on Mount Athos, he went to a a, a, a hermitage or a skeet. And uh, they had an icon there that was a reproduction mm -hmm. of the Aviron icon. He he asked to purchase it. They basically said that it wasn't for sale. He stayed the night and was going leaving the next day. And when he was leaving, uh, the 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 abbot of the Skiti ran out with the icon and told him that he had to take it. And so uh, Brother Jose, mm -hmm. the icon started to do the Oculus of the Mother of God before the icon and pray before the other mother the icon and it began streaming myrrh. And so that was the that was kind of the original myrrh streaming icon that came to Rokor. Um the, the kind of end of the story is that Brother Jose had given someone the icon to hold. The icon apparently is is on Mount Athos now secretly. Um, but he was staying in Athens at the time and and some Satanists broke into his hotel room and murdered him. And this is all, you know, public. You can you can read the whole story. And, mm -hmm. and then, fast forward several years, uh, somebody gifted, who is now Father Nectarios in in Hawaii, a copy of that icon of the of the Montreal icon, and he had it in his home, and it began streaming myrrh. And so, when you see the icon in um, San Francisco, that is the icon. That oh, wow. that is the icon okay. that streams. Yeah, so Father Nectarios has taken it really all over the world, Georgia, okay. Russia. Uh, I think it's been to Greece. I would assume it's been to Greece, but I know it's been to Georgia and Russia. I assume it's been to Greece. It's been to, it's been to many countries. It's been all over the United States, Canada. Oh. So, yeah, he so he travels with the icon. Okay. Yeah, I didn't – I wasn't real familiar with it, but my, my godmother was there, and she had a bunch of cotton balls – and yeah. yeah, she gave them to me, yeah. and she, and she said, you know, you can soak up the the myrrh. But I remember when um, they walked in to the cathedral, the with the icon. Boy, the smell was overwhelming. It was so strong. I wasn't because there's was a lot of people there, and I wasn't that close. But wow, that was that was amazing. It's like the second the icon came came in you could smell yeah. it you could smell the strong and nice smell too <laughs> well 
that's I mean, the first time I ever saw the icon, I was in seminary and they brought the icon and and you know, to be to be honest at the time, I was just didn't really know about it. I'm like, you know, kind of what is this? I probably had a little bit of reservation, you know what I mean? Yeah. It was like, okay, like just you know, I'm probably a naturally kind of questioning <laughs> slash distrustful person. Yeah. And I was up in the choir loft and they began chanting the Akathis to the mother of God. And the aroma came all the way out, all the way up into the choir loft. And I was like, okay, that's, you can't, (laughs) I'm like, you can't do that. That doesn't, that doesn't happen with aromas. You know what I mean? If you had a, if you had a whole bottle of perfume and started spraying it in the middle of the church, that's, that's, that wouldn't travel 40, 50 feet up into the choir loft, you know, and it, the whole church began to fill with this 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 aroma of myrrh and i was like that's that's <laughs> not normal so that, um, you're, <laughs> yeah. you're right i i don't want to talk too too long uh you're right because uh, i don't know something about russians they like everything cold but every time at the cathedral there's doors big doors on each each side of the cathedral and um uh the where the cathedral is out out in the richmond it's it's chilly out there and it's it's uh breezy so they had both doors open and man it was cold in there and it was it was it was the the breeze going through but and i was near the door but you're right the second that icon came in you could smell the 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 myrrh that was amazing so yeah it's very powerful the 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 odor in there is very 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 powerful yes yes uh, so you could see when they they uh brought the icon to our parish a couple times well wow. uh, we were blessed to have our lady with us and and uh, one of the years we put the icon on the analoy with the cloth underneath it you know yeah, yeah, and the yeah. cloth over the the course of the service yeah just became saturated, just merge, just coming down the front of the cloth. So over the course of, you know, two and a half hours, three hours, just it all became saturated. So it was very, yeah, yeah it's it's, yeah. Wild, it's very wonderful. It's very wonderful to be in the presence of the mother of God and and to pray for people. And, and um, yeah, I mean, we prayed for one woman under the icon of the mother of God just a couple of years ago. She had her baby within the last year and um, so th- there's many, 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 and this is like after years of marriage and, and not having any children. Oh, wow. Um, so yeah, very powerful, very, very powerful miracles from our lady and, uh, and, 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 a very powerful and tangible sense of her presence when you're, when you're with the, when you're with the icon. So, Great. yeah. Thank you, father. Um, real quick i'm just curious where were you where were you born and 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 when and then uh what what religion if any were you were you raised in father so i was born in in ontario canada in the early 80s 81 um i'll be 43 this year uh and then my dad is from the states my grandfather is actually from texas um there's there was quite a bit of family here in Texas actually, but my right. my father basically grew up in California. So mm-hmm. my parents met in the states in college. Uh, my dad went to seminary at Westminster in Philadelphia, and then they then they went back up to Canada where my mom is from, and they were there for I think ten or ten or eleven or twelve years, something mm-hmm. like that. And then uh, my dad, you know, could not handle the cold of Ontario and and despised it. And uh, all the overcast. It's not just the cold in Ontario. It's really that it gets overcast. Mm. Like, it's brutally. I mean, it's it is a brutal uh, weather system because you know it can be like a month where you just don't you just don't see the sun. Mm. It's just a you know you got that kind of hazy orange ball behind the clouds, and uh, it's 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 awful. Anyway, mm. so my family moved to Southern California when I was nine Mm, mm. and I lived most of my life in Southern California. Wow. That's kind of, it's, I mean, I would say it's home, but the only person who still lives there now is really my dad lives somewhere in LA and my, my uh, sister lives somewhere in the LA area also, but my brother has moved. My mom has moved. Obviously we've moved. And so, but yeah. 
What what were you were you raised in any religion, any organized? Yeah, religion? my dad was a PCA minister, so Presbyterian Church in America. Okay. Which is a uh conservative uh reformed Calvinistic reformed branch. Okay. So it, it it's um you know, my family life was very divorced from our Christian faith, it felt like. So, I mean, you know, I always, I always, I, I don't try not to go into a lot of details because it's other people's kind of sins, but, you know, my parents didn't have, you know, they didn't have a good marriage. So there mm -hmm. was a lot of fighting. Oh, uh, my dad had a lot of issues. Uh, so growing up in that, you know, people often talk about like, oh, you rebelled, you know, you rebelled against Christianity. It's like, you didn't rebel against Christ, you know, because if that's Christianity, when when people are screaming at each other and all this other stuff, you don't want anything to do with it. You're, there's no, you don't have an attraction to Christ because everything that is modeled for you is 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 unchristian. So you hear about it in kind of a detached intellectual way, but there's a lack of of interpersonal kind of bonding that takes place. So you know my 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 family life was very tumultuous. So I didn't, I, I, I didn't really, uh, how do you want to put it? I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't anti Christianity. I just didn't embrace it. And nobody really showed me how to have a relationship with God, how to pray. Obviously there's no fasting, you know, it, it just, it wasn't, it, it's in a lot of Protestantism. It's so intellectually divorced from praxis yeah. that as a kid you you know you go to services or you go to whatever you just kind of sit there sing some songs or listen to a sermon that doesn't really pertain to you or <laughs> you know what I mean or go to youth group or whatever it's just all kind of it's just whatever it's not yeah. it's not it, it's it's not faith it, it's not active faith it yeah. doesn't it doesn't grow your spiritual life okay so when I was 14 and started you know smoking pot and then taking drugs and doing all that you know, I very quickly kind of went into more of the new age, uh, you know, all paths lead to God and, and, and Buddhism and, and new age literature. I mean, real like new agey books about how okay. everyone's connected and, and kind of whatever Christ consciousness type stuff and all, all of that kind of woo woo stuff. So, but it was very much linked with, you know, drug use and, and, hallucinogenics and all of that sort of stuff so anyways that was kind of that was that was kind of more of my quote-unquote religious formation in a lot of ways hmm. you sound like uh somebody else i've interviewed you sound like father turbo well you know he you know he and i are like long-term friends or no I, do you know i i i, I, I kind of gathered that but yeah. i didn't i didn't i don't know where your guys's lives intersect like outside well, of orthodoxy but yeah, so when when I first like when I first started coming to Orthodoxy in Southern California, my wife and I went to college. We actually went back to Canada and went to college in Canada. So we got married. We were young, twenty and twenty one, and we went to Canada. And um, when we came back, like we discovered Orthodoxy in in Canada, then came back, and then I was obviously in that area, Southern California, in my mid twenties. So I'm like showing up to Orthodox events or whatever else. And, you know, I've got, you know, full, I've got full sleeves and, and got, yeah. I, got, I have a few. <laughs> so I like full sleeves, I'm all tatted up. And so every, like pretty much every person who met me was like, do you know Turbo? Do you know Turbo Qualls? You know, so like that was, he was like the other guy in Orthodoxy who was like all tatted up in the, you know, early, <laughs> early 2000s, whatever it was, mid 2000s. Uh, that was covered in tattoos. <laughs> so anyways, we ended up just crossing paths through that. I think we met at, at the St. Barbara Monastery in Ojai, where wow. uh, my spiritual mother is, Mother Victoria. Wow. And uh, so we just hit it off and just we just had a lot in common. So, I mean, we're still, I mean, he's, you know, kind of one of my best friends. I mean, we're, we've been close for, you know, almost two decades or whatever it's wow. been. So, Yeah. He's I, the godfather for one of my sons, and wow. we talk all the time. So, yeah, wow. yeah, yeah. So I, it's I, fun. Even when I was going to seminary, I was like, dude, you need to go to seminary. 
Like you need, I was the one who was like, you need to go. So he's like, I don't know, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, dude, you need to go to seminary. I'm like, da, da, da. Like, anyways, it was a whole thing. So hmm. we've been, we've been kind of together on those paths. I mean, they, they, I went to seminary. He didn't, he went to the Antiochian school. He ended up with the Serbians. Obviously I ended up with Rokor, but, hmm. uh, but yeah, anyways, very, very close friends. So I, I, yeah, my I, brother. I, I love him. So, um, if if you don't mind me asking, how how old were you when I assume your mom and dad broke up? How how old were you when that happened? So I was a I was an adult at the time when they actually divorced. Oh, but there's a couple things. I mean, number one was my dad was around, but he was very emotionally detached. Uh, yeah. So he was that kind of. Uh, uh, I don't want to use the pejorative kind of boomer, but he was that not involved, not engaged father. So emotionally, I would say that he was really became very emotionally detached sometime, I think around when I was 10 ish, maybe 11 ish, and then hmm. onward. And then really, I think, it, you know, 14, 15, I mean, he just, he got embroiled in work and the internet and other stuff and was just, you know, he, he was very detached. Now he and I had radically different dispositions and um, we just didn't have much of a connection personality wise. I mean, there just wasn't a, there wasn't a real strong connection. I mean, that's really what it was. I mean, my mom is, I, I mean, I love my mom very close. You know, I'm close with my mom. Uh, but my my mom is more of a kind of hard charger, uh, get stuff done, whatever else. And she's, you know, a little feisty woman. And so she just had a, to be honest, she just has a lot more kind of male energy than my dad did. Um, mm, wow. And so in a lot of ways, I was really closer with my mom or more connected to my mom than I was my dad. And, and so it was twofold. I mean, one, my dad was out of shape. He he was a computer guy and he wasn't a sports guy or he wasn't athletic at all. And he, he just and he just didn't he 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 just had him and you know he just had a disposition that wasn't very masculine. And so on top of being emotionally hmm. unavailable, his personality was something that we just didn't really connect in any way, you know. I mean, probably the only thing we ever connected on was like science fiction or something you know what mm. i mean like maybe we'd watch science fiction or something together because that was something that was both of us found interesting but um so i just mm. you know i i mean it, it's kind of one of those things at the time that was hugely disappointing to me i i obviously there is a very deep longing within a boy's heart to have a dad, to have a father figure, to have a connection, okay. to have somebody who hands that on to you. Um, it, but he just, it just wasn't there. And uh, what he did have to offer wasn't much and I wasn't really interested. So it just, it, it you know, we just, we just didn't connect. I mean, yeah. I think that that's probably, the biggest thing and then you know he and my mom are fighting and arguing and upset and all this other stuff so they didn't end up divorcing i think until my brother turned 18 wow which put me at 24 but for all intents and purposes they had essentially you know behaved you know not very charitably to each other for 15 years or whatever yeah so if anything it was just kind of brutal like uh the, the whole thing was very brutal so yes yeah, yeah. It, it's interesting you describing your father because it's kind of the opposite for me my dad is what was got a soul my dad is was italian v very alpha male and m i was not probably still i'm not but um so it's interesting that you're the dynamic with your father was kind of the opposite but i think i mean no matter how that that manifests i think if if a father and son you know, f fail to, uh, like you said, connect or, or communicate well, it, it has a lot of repercussions. And now just talking to you for a few moments, I can see why, why you're, you're attuned to this. 
I, I but think it, one. Yeah, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Go, go, no, but one last thing, Father, about what you were saying, and and also, even though if uh, a mother and father are together, growing up in that kind of dysfunctional, hostile environment is is not good. So go ahead. Yeah. So two thoughts on that. Like number one is I think sometimes um, I really don't like the term alpha male in describing men. No, 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 not, not what I should say is, uh, uh, I, 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 don't, I don't know. My dad was, was a, no, 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 sorry, very sorry. aggressive. He was aggressive. What I, yeah. What yeah. I would say is, I don't think that being an alpha male is the pinnacle of being a male. Sure. That's what I don't think. What I value is genuineness. Mm. So masculinity isn't one type. Like there are guys who are very masculine who love to bake, mm. love to cook. Mm. They're, they're not, not masculine because they have to like sport. Like I don't watch sports, right? Mm. I mean, I don't, I just don't, I, I don't watch any really. Uh, and if I was, it'd be like strong man or something that 90% of people would think is boring anyways. But <laughs> the thing is, is I, I think we get kind of pigeonholed into, into thinking that masculinity is, is, uh, doing certain male activities. I agree. And I think that masculinity is much, much, much deeper than that. So even like when I go to the monastery and I meet the monks or I spend time with the monks or whatever else, these are not alpha males. They're just not, that's not their disposition. They're not, but I, but why do you feel so much love and affinity to them? Cause they're so genuine because they, they exude real warmth, real love. They exude that, that beautiful calming effect that a good godly man has on you. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's, I think that, so when I say I didn't connect with my dad, it wasn't just that he wasn't, it wasn't just that he wasn't into things that I could um, be into with him. Yeah. It was that he was just, he was not happy with himself. Mm. It he, sounded, was very, yeah. he was a very conflicted person, just in who yeah. he is. He was yeah. very conflicted. And so he, it wasn't genuine. It wasn't warmth, yeah. right? I was thinking about like when I went, I, we, I was telling somebody else about this the other day. Like I went to the monastery here in Texas. This is like three years ago when I first came, I came and visited and they were like, Oh, that's, that's father Joseph, you know, and father Joseph's I'm five foot six. He's probably five, six, five, seven. And he's from, I think South Africa. And he is a priest, but you know, he's like humble. So he didn't tell me and they're all wearing cassocks. They don't wear crosses. You know what I mean? Hmm. He was like, oh, Father, your blessing, you know, and I, I gave him a blessing and then he just hugged me. And I was like, man, I was like, this is, this is like, I just, I could feel that love. Like it was so genuine. He was like, we're so glad you're here with us. Mm. And that was like, you had that deep sense of the brotherhood. Mm. And I was like, man, this, this is right. Like Father Joseph, he's probably not like, you know what I mean? He's not obviously this male alpha type, right? Mm -hmm. But he's mm -hmm. so genuinely himself mm -hmm. and he's so comfortable in his own skin that he can meet you and just give you a big hug mm -hmm. and tell you that he loves you mm -hmm. and that he's glad that you're there and you're like and just like oh i, I just mm -hmm. like touch my soul you know i'm like man like that's so it's it, it's that it's that um it, yeah that's a that i think is that beautiful thing that a, that a man can do that a good male figure who's strong and self-confident it doesn't have to be you don't have to be an athlete you don't have to be whatever hard charging or nitro or this or that or the other no, no, i get it but, yeah yeah no no i father i understand the yeah. the no what what you're saying is important because it it's it's it it sounded like you were more interested in more traditional masculine pursuits and your dad probably wasn't so that's where there wasn't a fit the but where you see it in and a lot of guys is sometimes the opposite where the dad is more you know traditionally masculine but the boy is maybe sometimes sequestered with the mother i could just remember with a lot of things like me growing up is my dad was 
you know, always a farmer and interested in farming tractors and farm equipment like that, where I was not coordinated in that way. So a lot of times like a boy like that will maybe get sequestered with the mother or the sisters and end up in the kitchen or the house and doing that stuff while dad's outside. And then that's where you get in a, you get in a problems too. And then one thing real quick about what father said about, I think what you're hitting on is real important is it masculinity isn't always, you know, tethered so strongly to, to maybe a physical appearance. I remember when I was in the eighth grade, I had a, a teacher and I really loved him because going through Catholic schools, we had all female teachers. I never had a male teacher and I didn't have any male role models. I'll ask you about that too. But he, and he was like a, I wouldn't say he was a, uh, well, he was kind of a, a physically like diminutive guy, but he had a very masculine core. He could like, like uh organize the kids and and you know just like what he said goes very quickly he had that that presence about him although he didn't look like uh he looked like a bookworm or like a professor mm -hmm. you know and but i really loved him because he he uh took a liking to me and was very protective and paternal to me and uh, yeah. i i had never really had that as a kid so that well, it was two things that I think father you were hitting on there. So, yeah, it was it was making me think that it's you know one of the hallmarks of a of a man is that he's confident. Yeah, that's and it. that he and that he's confident that he and and that he's comfortable in who he is. That's it. So sometimes when I meet guys who are like unapologetically kind of nerdy, whatever, yeah. I like it because yeah. they're being because they're being genuine. They're not yeah. like. You meet guys who are trying to be masculine and they'll be over aggressive and it doesn't ring true to me right? because I've known, I mean, I've known some, I've known some, what you would, I mean, I've known some gangsters. I've known some violent criminal <laughs> men, nicest guys, nicest guys. You know what I mean? Like real yeah, nice, polite. Yeah. guys who spent a lot of time in the California penitentiary system, nice guys. Nice guys. They'll stab you, but they're very nice. And they're very polite and they're very respectful. I mean, if they walk by you, they'll move. They won't bump shoulders with you. They won't be aggressive. Why is it? Because they know that every action of uh, is going to demand a reaction. And if you go here, they'll go here. But they're constantly very controlled in all their behaviors. And when you meet a man who's trying to be tough, and trying to be masculine and trying to be, oh, it's an overcompensation. You're like, listen, that's not you. That's not who you really are. Because if you were that guy, you wouldn't have to act like that guy. It's, yeah, a facade, exactly. it's, a, it's a fakery. It's not real. It's not genuine. So I likewise, when you meet somebody who's kind of, you know, whatever, nerdy or into science fiction or whatever, and they don't even care. They're like, I don't care that anybody thinks it's stupid or whatever else. And they like it and they embrace it. To me, I honestly have some respect for them because I'm like, listen, that's what you like. That's how kind of how you're hardwired. No, I don't like science. I like science fiction, some nerdy stuff also. But what I mean is like they're not trying to put on a facade of who they are. They're no. being genuinely themselves. Correct. And and that's a good thing, right? That's that's a good thing. And I think that that is one of those strengths of men is you have to be comfortable with who you are however you were made, however God made you. And I, I, and I think that that was part of where the ships in the night kind of pass each other with my own dad is I, I don't, I don't think that he was happy with who he was or what he was about. And I, I, you know, I don't need to go all the way down that path, but to me, that was just, it was, there was something unpleasing about that. So. No father. Yeah. yeah the, what I've noticed with young men you mentioned guys that are incarcerated and, and the majority of, you know, men that have been in prison either had a absent or abusive fathers. And I think a lot of times they, they, they swerve in that direction of, you know, criminality or especially if they get involved in gangs, cause they're looking for a, 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 a sort of masculine camaraderie or role model that they didn't have when they were growing up. Did, Besides your father, did you have any any men who were role models in in your life as as a kid or 
as a young you know, man. You want to know who all my all my role models were from books. I didn't I didn't really have a lot from life, but all the books that I read were all about the mafia. Like the the Italian mafia. Yeah, the Italian mafia. That was like my dream when I was a kid. Oh man. I started reading books on the mafia when I was like 12 <laughs> or 13. And of obviously I'm Scottish and I'm not Italian like at all. But I had I had such a draw to the way that they were that that was like that became Mm. so formative for me on how I saw uh, masculinity, which was so much of it was what was it was how they carried themselves. They had respect. They had power. They stood by their word. They didn't break their word for anybody. They had integrity. You know what I mean? There were all these different things within the fact that they were criminals. I mean, that's the mm. irony, right? Like, yeah. like that old school, that old school mafia what had a whole set of code that had to be followed. And for me, that there was an attraction there to that, to the code, to the respect, to the power, to the whole thing. It, it's, you know, the the mafia is, uh, you know, it is it is obviously a, a kind of hyper, I don't wouldn't even say hyper masculine, but a very masculine organization, where the masculinity is very defined. Yeah. You have to act masculine in a certain way, but all the desires of the of it are antithetical to the gospel, right? I mean, none mm -hmm. of it is about loving, mm -hmm. turning the other cheek, mm -hmm. forgiving your enemy. It's like blessing mm -hmm. those who bless you taking up your cross and following Christ. So I was imparted with a very poor set of values, but there was honestly a lot of, I think there was a lot of behavior and attributes that were noble. It's a so, hard, it's a hardcore patriarchy. And it's interesting because I think that that sort of ethos underlines a lot of like, gangster culture now that you see in rap that that sort of hardcore patriarchal and i think it appeals to young men who who haven't had a father or haven't had a father figure yeah i mean i mean gangs are gangs are a, i mean everybody always says gangs are people like when people are a part of a gang or, or they're they're like that's my real family exactly what are they really saying is I didn't have a family. Exactly. And I have an internal desire for a family. And so I have to, so I have to supplement my family That's with it. something else. That's right? it. That's it. Exactly. And I got, it. yeah. And I got, I got in a different kind of gang, a gay gang, but that's another story. Well, and that's the thing is that it is that no matter who you are as a man, I think until you kind of reach a full level of maturity and I, I, you, you need affirmation from other men. I think there's a much higher level of being a man mm -hmm. where you don't need anybody's affirmation anymore. Okay. You just don't care. Yeah, it's it's just important. But certainly when you're um, a young man, however long that lasts, yeah. uh, or you have that kind of, young man or juvenile mentality is you need the affirmation of other men to tell you that, you know, you're doing a good job and you're a man and, and keep going. And, you know, all those things that are important to you. Um, so. you, you yeah. You should get it as a, as a boy, as a child, typically from your, your father. But if you don't, and men are kind of longing for that, as adults or young adults, it's kind of weird. I think people say, well, you're, you're probably gay or something. If, you know, if, if you need love and affirmation from other men, I think it, 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 it becomes kind of, it, it's a difficult, it's a difficult path to maneuver when you're an adult. I think, I, I think because yeah. typically men, I mean, women are different. Women talk to each other, they gather in groups and they, they kind of work things out together. Men, not so much to typically do that. I think maybe things are changing, but men are supposed to be more solo, you know? <laughs> you know, it's interesting. I think the difference is, is that somebody pointed out this a long time ago to me, which was for women to connect, it's FaceTime. And for men to connect, it's shoulder time. Mm. Mm. So men like to do stuff together. That's I, the camaraderie. I agree. 
Um, so I don't think that it's, I don't think that men are solo. I don't think men are, are solo creatures by habit. Mm, I agree. I, I think that they're, I think they're, forgive me, but I think they're kind of like more of a pack animal mm. uh, and they have a hierarchy that they kind of figure out where they fit in and they, and they, and they adjust and they, you know, work through it. Like we just had our men's retreat. We had 30 men at our men's retreat. Wow. And it's like, I can guarantee you there was minimal deep conversation for three days but there was a lot of fun. <laughs> and what was, you know, I mean, you know, I'm sure like the arguments were around how long the brisket should be like cooked or whatever else, you know, like it wasn't, it, there wasn't, it, we had some conversation about world affairs and whatever else, but men don't sit around and open up their inner life to other men. Of and course. Group men. It's not natural to us. No, no. And, it, and it's really not even appropriate. No. I, I, uh, I remember there was a priest I knew who had, who had, uh, 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 like a men's study, and he wanted all the men to kind of open up in the men's study. I was like, "This is weird." I'm like, "I can't even. I couldn't even go to it." I was like, hey, dude, "We just don't do that as men." I don't. I'm not doing that with other men. It's just not natural. I'll call <laughs> Father Turbo. I'll pour my heart out to Father Turbo. Yeah, one on one, one right? Because I love him and he's my brother, right? I'll be completely transparent with him, one on one. But we don't do kind of group therapy. That's not. It's just not the masculine ethos. And when we want to connect with other guys, we don't sit there and go, hey, let me let me tell you about what's going on inside of me. It's not important. That's that's yeah. not important for other people to I carry agree. my emotional state or 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 uh, help it out or fix it or, or, or you know, supplant it, affirm it. It's just not masculine. Everybody's carrying their own burden. I respect that about other men. And I assume they respect that about me. And when we get together, it's like, let's have fun. I agree. Let's do fun stuff, and and I think that's part of it is that men carry such a stressful burden that when they get together, they just need to have fun. They just need to forget, like, oh, well, let's go out and shoot a hundred dollars worth of ammo, even though financially maybe that's not the best decision. But it's like, why do men go out and do that, or do whatever they're doing, or burn through, or buy you know a bunch of meat, or do whatever you know? Why? Because they need to be together. And they need to be doing something fun that helps them forget about projects and deadlines and stresses and expectations and whatever else. So the difference too between women and men is women carry much more of a grind. The, the female is more of a grinder. It's interesting too, because if you look at athletics, the one sport, I don't know, and somebody correct me in the comments if I'm wrong on this, but the one sport where men and women are equal is long distance running. So there's a woman named Courtney DeWalter mm. and, and she's like, you know, in the top five or whatever, ultra marathon runners, male and female, mm. there's nothing like that in other sports. Mm. There's not even close to that in other sports, but what does that tell us? Women are really good at grinding. They're really good at just pacing and keeping the grind. Right. And that's what being a mom is. It's a, it's a gnarly 14, 15 hour shift of just grinding away with children. Wow. Whereas a man will go away to an office and, and the expectations, the pressures, the stress is like sky high. Yeah. So being a mom is less stressful. It's very hard. Yeah. It's very hard and very grinding, but it's not yeah. as, it doesn't have the same stresses. Like nobody's coming knocking on the door to her office and it's like, Hey, you know, where, where are you tracking right now and your budget numbers for this month and blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? Like, Women don't have that um, in the same way that men do. And, uh, you know, I, I remember even a little while ago, this is a, I don't know, maybe this is a year ago or something, but my kids were in uh, a class, like a, a gymnastics type class or whatever. And one of the coaches was getting irritated with them. They weren't listening or doing something. And my wife was like, I'm ready to pull them out. And I said, no, I'm like, it's good. I'm like, it's good for them to be in there because they need to understand when they don't listen to a man or they don't follow instructions they need to understand he's going to be irritated with them and he's going to let them know. <laughs> and I said, you know, don't you ever, didn't you ever have that at work where somebody spoke harshly to you? And she hmm. looked at me she's like, no one ever speaks harshly to me. And I realized that's a difference, you know, mm -hmm. like in all her years of employment, whatever, until we had kids and everything else. That's right. We don't talk to women like that, mm -hmm. but men have to endure the pressure and the stress from mm -hmm. other men form 
And so getting away is about mm. forgetting all that pressure and stress and having a good time and, and spending shoulder time together, connecting and forming that bond shoulder to shoulder. So, yeah. I agree, Father. That that reminds me of, you know, growing up in an Italian home and the women, I mean, when we got together, like with family, is that the women would be typically in the kitchen talking a lot, like endlessly. And then the, my dad and the guys were outside, like around the tractor, like looking at it or something like there was some problem with it or something, but like saying very little, you know, it, it was interesting. I remember watching that as a kid, I was like, Oh, I would much rather be with the guys. I don't know. It seems interesting. I think, you know, men, yeah, you, it's more, uh, a verbal than with women. And, um, I, I, but again, I think if, if a boy isn't, in that world as a as a kid there's something wrong and i you mentioned like office work i think that's important too because i mean my my dad grew up in a very agrarian society in, in sicily so the the line that separated men and women was, was pretty stark you know girls learn certain things not that they're typically female but it's just the way it was. W girls learn certain things, typically with the house, you know, sewing and cooking and that stuff. And the boys were more with the dad and it was like farming stuff. But when, like you were talking about men going to the office, I think when men started going to the office, that kind of broke because your son didn't go to the office with you, didn't go to yeah. work with you. And b boys and girls were left with, mom at home and i think raising kids became like a very female kind of thing and dads were kind of like came home crashed had a drink and watched tv or watched football or whatever and dads kind of came became not involved with their kids especially their sons which is what they should do and then like men go into their man cave you know play video games and which is, i always thought was kind of weird but but it, it 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 it's it's boys aren't with men a lot anymore. I think that that's I, I think one of the reason that one of the reasons why that is I think twofold. I mean, number one is men are not with other men in our society, so men go to work with other men, but we don't have you know. I remember I remember I remember this concept from twenty five years ago. My Pretty much one of my first jobs was working at Starbucks. And they and the idea behind Starbucks was that Starbucks would be the third place. That's what they wanted it to be. So you had home, you had work, and then you had Starbucks. And they wanted to constantly kind of drill that into people that you need to go to your third place, which is Starbucks, and spend money. Historically, that was church. So historically, yeah. people had home and work and church. And then when you went to church, you had male companionship. And the thing was, is that male companionship, again, after World War II, I think was stronger because a lot of the men had gone through the same traumatizing and difficult situations. So there was a bond there. That's and uh, I, as time went on and people just stopped going to church, that stopped happening. And then as church, both Protestant and Catholic in the United States became mm -hmm. more feminized. Yep became more emotional mm. and were like that's, that's it. they were like what am i what what do i what am i grabbing onto here men, men are not like that like i was talking uh uh with a neighbor of mine about this and he was asking me uh i don't know if you saw there was a big kerfuffle at this kind of man conference mm, mm, mm. protestantism yeah. like, so they've got like monster trucks like yeah. monster trucks is not masculine like this stuff is so corny like this is like it's 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 so corny. It's so corny. Anyways, cheese ball. And then they had that guy who was dancing on the pole. Yeah, weird. And then the guy comes out and says, "Hey, this is this is this isn't appropriate." And the other guy rebukes him and takes him. The, all this nonsense. But the point is, he was like, "What do you think?" I'm like, "Oh, oh, forgive me. I don't mean this in a in a the pejorative way. I mean this in a literal way." I said, "A lot of this worship is very gay." 
Yeah, I agree. It, it has a very homoerotic energy to it. And it's about it's about evoking this longing and this emotion for God that's 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 weird. That's not us as men. If a man want if a man wants to accomplish something spiritually, he goes to the woods. He goes to the beach. He goes someplace, he finds someplace quiet where he can think and he can sit and he can settle himself and he can calm down and, and turn it over and contemplate it and be with it. When I first encountered orthodoxy, I remember I looked at Roman Catholicism hmm. very deeply and I was like, it's a, it's a very homosexual energy. The, the dress, the lack of beards, the lack of masculine, the lack of women, the lack of men who want to be with women. Yeah, I hear you, Father. So that's a very strange dynamic. Um, all of those different things, uh, 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 you, you know, very much like a, like a musical, performative. Mm -hmm. All of these things are, are odd. They're off. Uh, when I looked at Orthodox, it was like a couple of, you know, uh, black, long, scraggly beard, stern looking monks in the wilderness. <laughs> exactly. Living in like a cabin. I was like, that's what men do. When yeah. men connect with God, they go to the woods. That's what they do. They go to the mountains. They go to the beach. They go somewhere silent to contemplate and to pray and to be with God. That's why our services are set up with that it, all of the service, you know, none of the services are emotional. Even the way that we read in church, I was just mentioning this to somebody. Uh, when we're reading the Psalter in church, it's monotone. It's baseline. It's we don't go, oh Lord, crush thine enemies. You know, like we don't we don't inflect good or bad, happy or sad into anything that we do in the church. Mm -hmm. And why is that? Because some people are happy and some people are sad, and there's enough room in the services to be rejoicing and sorrowful but the but the but the church gives you space to pray and to be present and in fact one of the first times i i i i i started going to an orthodox church with my wife it was a very natural fit for my wife we went a few times and mm. then visited my aunt and my aunt said oh we're going to you know we were still protestant at the time we weren't even catechumen uh we had just been attending and kind of checking it out we go with my aunt to this Protestant worship service and they pull out these horns. They're doing this crate. And I left. I was like, I go, you can't even pray here. You can't even hear yourself think. There's nothing contemplative, meditative at all about this. This is a cacophony of noise. I'm like, I'm out of here. This is not prayer. This is, you cannot pray here. You cannot convince me that you can pray here. You can't. It's not possible. And so uh, when we think about that in terms of masculinity, we need stillness. We need quiet. It's not that we don't like talking. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, both of us, both of us, I see, I can tell our talkers, you know, I love hanging out. I have a women's group at my, at my house once a week mm -hmm. that I help, you know, that I lead. Right. And I talk all the time. I talk all the time to women. I love talking with women. Different. It's just a different energy mm -hmm. than talking with men. And the things that men need to do for their spiritual life is way different than what a woman needs to do for hers. I think women tend to be very collaborative. I'm going to bring this up towards, mm. the, towards the end. And I think men need solid direction. And I think men need good leadership. And I think that's what I found in Orthodox. Because I'm here for everything you said, Father, about Catholicism, because although I was raised, born and raised Catholic, everything you said about the Catholic Church is true, rings very true to me. And and I didn't, and I don't know if it's, if it's just mandatory celibacy in, in Roman Catholicism that has caused this 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 effeminization, but I haven't picked it up in in orthodoxy. I don't. Yeah, know if it's, I, I don't know if it's I, more I, complicated than just the celibacy, but because you certainly meet men who are trad Catholic who have a bunch of kids, love their wife, and I know. Have a, right, and are masculine men. 
I know. But those are the same men who wouldn't become priests because they couldn't have a wife. Exactly. So they've they've excluded all of the, the men. Good, the good guys. I mean, they've excluded. They've excluded kind of anybody who's kind of heteronormative. I mean, it just yeah. it, it, yeah. I know it, it. It's too bad in Catholicism because I what I like in Orthodoxy is it because some guys are drawn to celibacy and want a monastic life. So there's a place there's a place for them to have that. But if like you yourself, if you don't, there's a place for you as well. But in Roman Catholicism, yeah, there isn't. It's just that's it. There's no choice. And you and I'm sure that you're aware of this. I mean, I've been to a lot of monasteries and like, you know, I've had monks open up and they're and they're guys who are same sex attracted. Mm. And they said, hey, you know, that this is I don't like using the term homosexual because I, I think it 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 well, one, it was a created term. It creates like a different class of person. Uh I think that there's some there's a lot of things that are attached to it that I think are right. manipulative. Right. But I've met monks that are that are same sex attracted, and they're like, "Oh, they're thriving in the monastery because they have brotherhood, you know, and it doesn't have to be sexual, and they don't have to follow their sexual desires or inclination, but they still have the fellowship, the brotherhood, the life of prayer, and and the life of salvation without without all of the temptations." of having to do it on their own, living in the world. And can, some, I'm not saying that there's not a one size fits all, but what yeah. I'm saying is for those guys, it's really works. In it, it, it can work. Like you said, father, where I've seen it go off the rails in Roman Catholicism is where it becomes like self-selecting where you have a group of men. And let's say you have a few that are same sex attracted but then they start self-selecting other men who are same self attracted. Yeah. And then it becomes an entire group of, let's say gay guys. And then it becomes like really toxic. And I, I was in a group like that, man, that's really, that's, that's bad. <laughs> so yeah. it, it can work if you've got a very good, like I said, leadership in that, yeah. mon that monastery where, uh, I, do you call him an abbot in, in orthodoxy? Yeah, an abbot or and, this, uh, yeah, abbot. where that where the abbot is really very good. The, I think the big thing too yeah. is in, in in Orthodox you have in the even in the monastic life especially you have very strict asceticism. Mm. So everything about the asceticism is to bring down our passions, our desires, our self will, okay. right? All of those things in order to get us to a baseline that's more manageable. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it's it's true. I mean, when somebody, you know, it's so funny, people ask about certain things. Like, if you read an article on how to raise your testosterone, the number one thing in any article is like, eat more red meat. Mm. So why? Because it, it has an effect on raising yeah. your testosterone, yeah. the protein synthesis, whatever else. I do think on some level, there's some kind of energy that's imparted eating animal products. Mm. Um, so it's mm. interesting in the monastic setting. They don't wipe a lot of that stuff out yeah. and you get rid of it in order to, to bring down the inclinations, the desires, the passions, yep. the intensity. Yep. So, and then on top of it, what is it? Less sleep, more prostrations, right? Everything in order to kind of help to keep you in a, in a more prayerful state, which you need when you're living that life of, of being alone in a monastery. Yeah. It's so, that's, that's hardcore and it's not for everybody, but for those who can do that kind of life, yeah. It. I wanted to show, I, I'm trying to keep you too long. I wanted to share my screen, Father, with you. And I just I just wanted to show some some slides. About, yeah. And I put some stuff together that, because people might think that, I mean, well, the, the attitude nowadays, especially in America, is that kids don't need two parents they, mm. cer the, they certainly don't have to be of the same sex you can have two women two men one one woman one man you know it's crazy but so there is like scientific you know truth to this that children do better in a two-parent household 
with a man and a woman. <laughs> well, I, that I, sounds crazy nowadays, but <laughs> I think the thing is, is that again, like a lot of things within our society, it's the ideal that's put forward, but not yeah. the reality. And you yeah. can't, you can't challenge the ideal. So when the ideal yeah. is like, Oh, this should work. I think much like I would assume you would think also in 25, 30 years, we're going to have a flood of people who are going to come out of these quote unquote, same sex oh. families and say, I, I, I never had a dad. Oh. Like that was traumatizing or oh. like, I never had a mom. Like I was a boy growing up oh. without the love of a mother because I had two, I had two dads and they got a surrogate woman to birth me. This is a travesty for the children. It's a it's a total abuse of them psychologically. I know them. I I know some of these kids, um, um, or that were those kids. Uh, the the one thing true I think that's true is it. I mean, a woman can do I think a a very good job raising children, including sons, alone. I mean, women widows have done it for generations, but I think where it works is that that boy has a father figure somewhere else in his life. I think 100%. where I've seen it with men and I'm saying this is somebody that's not into organized, you know, organized sports is it where I've seen it with guys. What worked is the man had a, a good father figure, usually like a coach or something. And so some, an uncle, like if his yeah. mom's brother, his mom's brother who lives in the same city, yeah, comes over, takes him out, they do stuff together. He has sons, so then he hangs out with his cousins and his uncle, yeah. and he's part of that group dynamic. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I like I like people kind of laugh sometimes, but I like the TV series Little House on the Prairie. Because people think it's like a a girl show, because it, it is a lot of the girls, and it's kind of from the girls' point of view. But what what Michael Landon did in that show that was really good, because it is a lot about men. Because a lot of times he did stories about where like a boy was either like the father was dead or the father was neglectful or abusive or horrible or whatever, and it was always like the men in the town got together and either like whooped the dad. Or, you know, stepped in and like helped that kid. Mm. And that you don't see anymore, you know. So, uh, you know, what's interesting is that I just <laughs> read this the other day um, from, oh, I'm drawing a blank on his name. I'll get his name back. I just did a talk the other day and I referenced him in the talk. Uh, Galloway is his last name. He just did a TED talk on this and then he did an interview. And in the interview, he was talking. I know who he is. Yeah. Yeah, he was talking about this in the interview on on Rich Roll about the fact that there's young men and they need father figures. And he goes, but you don't want to come across as being weird or creepy or this or that. Oh, there's but he a also lot of said something really interesting. He said, uh, I'm not part of a religious organization. And I realized like that's a thing, is that is that young men who don't have a strong father figure who come to church with their mom yeah. when they have healthy, strong male figures in the church, they get that. Yep. They're supposed to get that. I remember yep. talking, from a female's perspective, I remember talking with the the Yeradisa, the, uh, the the spiritual mother of the monastery in, in Michigan, uh, the Romanian monastery there, Mother Gabriella, and she told me that she, her father was uh, passed away when she was very little. I said, wow, that must have been really hard. She says it wasn't that bad. She says, I had another friend and her dad was like a father figure. Oh, too. see, perfect. And I was like, okay. And, but that was normal. You know, people picked yeah. up the slack and helped each other out is yeah, what they, you're talking about in a functioning society. They don't anymore. I mean, people mm -hmm. that people can live in a house for like 20 years and not know their neighbors, you know? So not that you have to, but you know, people don't have that sense of but very divorced. Society yeah. is very divorced. That's the thing, Father, that I love about I don't know if it's just Russian Orthodoxy, because I was I was baptized in Rokor, but mm -hmm. it's like it's like damn. It's very Italian because I get along with Russians because I think <laughs> I I think Russians scare some people, but they are very Italian. They're loud and they're very opinionated. But they well, man, when I started going to my Rokor parish, it was like I'm part of the family now. I mean, talk about the mafia. You know, it's just like 
you're you're part of our family now and there is <laughs> uh, yeah it, it is yeah there's a lot there can be a lot of that but i like it, it. i like it i like it oh it's it's you feel like you're part of you feel like you're part of something because they know what they have yeah and it's defined you know what i'm saying so like yeah Somebody was telling me, I talked to this guy yesterday. This guy was talking to me yesterday. He says, you know, he's because he's trying to, he's kind of a, he's going to become a catechumen. I think we're going to make him a catechumen. And he's been checking out different churches. And he came to our church yesterday. We got to talk a bit on Saturday night. And we talked a bit on Sunday morning. And he said, yeah, you know, he goes, um, he goes, yeah, I was at Posca. I think it was an, I think it was an OCA parish. And he goes, but I was sitting and talking with, this is a guy in his early 20s. Uh, and, and, uh, he goes, but I was sitting and talking with the Russian women Mm. and they said to me, this isn't, this isn't like, this isn't orthodoxy. They go, the women, they don't wear head coverings. They're wearing jeans. Mm. They're they're not dressed appropriately. So like, they're like, this is not how we behave in an orthodox church. Basically. Mm. (laughs) He's like, and he said, it was like, it was kind of wild. He goes, man, they just like say whatever they want kind of thing. They just, he said, they don't care who hears them. So yeah, they're very much like, you know, and they have a very strict sense of what is kind of orthodoxy. What does it look like? What does it feel like? What are the things that are, you do that are acceptable versus not acceptable? Very mm. clearly delineated. Mm. And it's interesting because, because people often think like, Oh, these bound the boundaries are restrictive, and it's like no, the boundaries are protective. Mm-hmm. You create boundaries not to restrict people. That's that's never the the purpose of boundaries has never been to keep people in. Only mm-hmm. selfish, egotistical, narcissistic, self centered people think that boundaries are going to somehow hamper their display of self. Mm-hmm. Realistic, mm-hmm. sober minded, normal people who have been part of society for you know and seen society for thousands of years understand that boundaries are there in order to protect us and keep evil from encroaching on us correct correct that's what boundaries are for correct so and and i've noticed that men and women have their spheres of influence and not one is greater than the other but but when they work together it's really good and they do need each other too oh so so No, we do a lot. I mean, it's interesting because there's a lot of stuff that just falls into, you know, like we needed to pour concrete at the church. So it's like, well, obviously the sisterhood is not going to pour concrete at the church. Yeah, I mean, just like it's not going to happen. So it's like the brotherhood does that. Yeah. And then the and then the sisterhood like does all the flowers and all the beautification of the temple for Lazarus Saturday or for Palm Sunday, I should say. And for Holy Week, and then they have the flowers and the and the runners and everything set up for Pascha. You know, they do all that. And it's like, it's, it's you know, the women do the beautification and the upkeep and the men do the hard lifting. The grunt, and yeah. Yeah, that's, it's so funny in the church. You just, you see all these things are just, they're, they're just natural. They're just yeah. normal. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, like the women prep the meals and feed the men and the men... You know, the men thank the women by, you know, we remodeled our whole kitchen at the church, you know, and it's like, what does the sisterhood want? How do they want it? That's what we're here for as men. We're here to, you know, make it better for the women. Yeah. And there's there's that real, I I don't know what you want to say. It's love. It's love. It's a natural exchange of abilities in order to showcase your love for each other. Yeah. And if, and if, and if you want to destroy orthodoxy, blur those lines. Cause I mean, when I was in the, when I was a kid in the seventies, I mean, I saw it cause I was an altar boy and I could see it in, in Roman Catholicism where the mindset at the time was that, well, we got to get more female involvement in the liturgy. Yeah. And, and, and when that happened, the, the lines were blurred and nobody knew what the, the priest didn't know who he was. The it, the women thought they were priests, and it 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 was a disaster. And and you see it now in the Catholic Church. Nobody's nobody's going. So, well, and you you men need to be able to do stuff where it's just men. And the thing is, is that female dynamic, it's not a bad thing. We're no. not saying it's a bad thing. No, what we're saying is 
that there's a time and place, but that there's a certain thriving that happens when uh, men and women separate from each other and do things that are gender specific or yeah. even just with their own gender, yeah. you know, uh, and that's healthy and that's normal. And we've, we've somehow blurred all that, even in society. It's so funny because it's one of the, you know, obviously lifting weights, one of the hot topic issues in gym culture and that I've seen videos come up about, you know, I, I mean, I already understand what it's about. So I'm not like, I, I get it, which is there have been some of these videos about, oh, um, you know, kind of the immodesty level in mm. modern gym culture. Yeah, and uh, there's been some videos where women said, "Oh, these this guy was looking at me, or he was doing this," and then there's a commentary on it. Somebody's like, "No, he's just trying to work out. Like you're doing this." I mean, this is why I have a home gym, right? I have a home gym because I don't want to go to the gym. It's you know, if the gym was all dudes, I'd go to the gym, but it's not. It's become this weird circus. I know, of, I know, Father. I yeah. know where there. I know where there's gyms that are all dudes in San Francisco, but I don't. <laughs> I don't think you want to go. <laughs> lot, tons of positive feedback. Okay. All the. <laughs> I don't think you'd want to go. No, but 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 I but I hear you, Father. <laughs> the the I, I want to go through these slides. The the ca causal effects of father absence uh oh i've uh, marked all these we find strong evidence of father absence negatively affects children's social emotional development particularly by increasing externalizing behavior well what's that these effects may be more pronounced if father absence occurs during early childhood and during middle childhood and they may be more pronounced for boys than for girls the research base examining the long-term effects of father absence on adult outcomes is considerably smaller, but here too we see the strongest evidence for a causal effect on adult mental health, suggesting that the psychological harms of father absence experienced during childhood persist throughout the life course. That's a big deal. Increasing externalizing behavior, which is like boy, out. Bo boys acting out. Yeah, you no. get you get a lot of angry people nowadays especially in young men who are angry and people are like well why are they angry well probably because they had a rotten father you know or dad wasn't around i, I people think i'm blaming parents but you know, sometimes they need to be blamed so <laughs> meta-analysis of direct and indirect effects of father absence on, I don't even know what that word is, menarchial timing. The present study showed that father absence and associated stressors such as familial perturb perturb let's see, perturbation Perbation. and harsh family environment also afflicted physical development. Oh, this is an interesting study because people think that... Um, uh, trauma or abuse or neglect is all like it's all in the head it's all mental but this study actually showed that yeah it it also affected people physically which is crazy you know Sheesh. according to psychology today children's diminished self-concept and compromised physical and emotional security children consistently report feeling abandoned when their fathers are not involved in their lives, struggling with their emotions, episodic bounce of self-loathing, just goes on and on. Behavioral problems, fatherless children have more difficulties with social adjustment and are more likely to report problems with friendships. I, I could go on and on. Truancy and poor academic performance. 71% of high school dropouts are fatherless. Fatherless children have more trouble academically. Let's see, delinquency and youth crime, including violent crime. 85% of youth in prison have an absent father. Fatherless children are more likely to offend and go to jail as adults. Uh, I, I want to get to this. Promiscuity and teen pregnancy. Fatherless children are more likely to experience problems with sexual health. Oh, it goes on and on. Homelessness. 90% of runaway children have an absent father. 
Exploitation and abuse fatherless children are a greater risk of suffering physical, emotional, sexual abuse, physical health problems. Fatherless children report significantly more psychosomatic health symptoms, mental health disorders. Fatherless absent children are consistently overrepresented on a wide range of mental health problems, life choices, future relationships. Fatherless absent children tend to enter partnerships early. This is kind of like these men that's like failure to launch men who still live at home and like don't want to get married. I know a bunch of these guys are like in their thirties that like not even thinking about getting married. Uh, mortality, fatherless children are more likely to die Father, what the hell? Fa excuse me, father. Fatherless children are more likely to die as children and live an average of four years less over the lifespan. Well, you can chime in whenever you want, father. Fourth National Incident Study of Childhood Abuse and Neglect. Report to Congress. Just so people don't think I'm pulling this stuff out of like left, right wing, you know, you know. Children living with their married biological parents universally had the lowest rate, whereas those living with a single parent who had a cohabitating partner, oh, this is important, had a cohabitating partner in the household, had the highest rate in all maltreatment categories. Compared to children living with married biological parents, those whose single parent had a living partner had more than eight times the rate of maltreatment overall, over 10 times the rate of abuse, and nearly eight times the rate of neglect. So sometimes it's not better that a parent that's a single parent maybe has somebody else in the house. I mean, sometimes maybe that, I mean, that can be, I mean, I've known a lot of guys that had good stepfathers, but. There are some that have good stepfathers, but there is a very high propensity for men who have nefarious desires to get with women who already have children. Mm, that's it. That's it, father. Yeah. Thanks. There's, I mean, there's, I mean, it isn't, of course, there are, there are normal men out there. Of course, there who, of course. Who enter into relationship, but if you're looking at a whole, you know, if you think about, <clears throat> let's say, a, I mean, this is, this is the scary reality, but if a woman divorces or whatnot, and she's in her thirties with children, the type of man who's going to make the decision to take on those other children sometimes is a great man in love with the mom. Yeah. But there is a percentage that are not great men. And there's actually a, a percentage that like the mom and just don't like the kids. And yeah. that's where the uh, maltreatment and the abuse happens. Because they don't really want the kids. They just want the mom. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and if you think about a man who has lots of prospects for women, a man choosing a woman in her 30s or whatever that already has children if he has lots of other prospects is probably not going to be moving in that direction. Right. Correct. It, it's, it's more likely than a man who has less prospects and less ability to find a wife who is, does not have children. Uh, so he's defaulting to, to the woman who already has children because it's available to him. I, I know it sounds a little harsh, but that is the reality. But the stu this study substantiates what your opinion is. <clears throat> well, the other, <clears throat> I don't know if you saw this, but there was a study that that said if basically if the mom goes to church with the children and the dad doesn't go, and uh, it's like thirteen percent of children will stay in church. If the mm. dad is a involved dad yes. and he goes to church with the family, it's like ninety two percent chance. Yeah. <clears throat> the other thing is too, I understand that it's very hard being a single mother. I, I am not, I am not putting down women who are being single mothers, but the reality is all of the studies show that you're, you're actually better off being raised by a single father. Mm. But why is that? Because, because as an infant or as a little child, you need more nurturing and more love. And as you get older, you need more discipline and structure. And 
And that's much more difficult for women because mm -hmm. it's they're not inclined to it in their personalities. And they're not, you know, if you have a boy, you have a boy who's 12 to 13 years old, he's already physically more substantial than his, than his mom. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I, you know, I have a son who's nine years old who pretty much weighs what his mom weighs. Yeah. I, I don't think he could take my wife, but in a <laughs> fight, but he's nine years old. Yeah. And when he's 14, he's going to be five foot 10 and 200 pounds. Like the, just, you know, there's no comparison. Yeah, it's it's intimidating, and that's when even a good mom can lose control. So, yeah. and and they do. Well, and and, and yeah. men have men tend to have the feeling that they've been gypped or taken advantage of or lost out because they didn't mm -hmm. have a dad, and that mm -hmm. breeds an anger and a resentment. That's it. And uh, they don't know how to uh, you know kind of quell or control those feelings. Uh, even even <clears throat> even with men and women as a dad, where I have five sons, my wife is not going to really teach my boys how to regulate their emotions. My wife is a sweetheart. She's a sweet, she's a sweet, you know, she's just a sweet lady. I mean, that's who she is, right? The one who's going to teach them how to regulate their emotions is by seeing me mm. and coaching on like, hey, I understand you're upset. I understand you're angry. Let's take a minute and calm down. And they're going to see that pattern come from their dad. Uh, that, and, and the thing is, is with mom, if the boys have a strong emotion, what does she want to do? Oh, come here, sweetheart. Come on. Da, 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 da. But for me, I'm like, hey, you need to get yourself in check. Yeah, it's a that... completely, it's a different, it's, you know, it's the male and the female yeah. energy. It's so different. You need both. Yeah. You need both. I mean, my yeah. wife is yeah. super precious and a wonderful yeah. mom yeah but that energy is very different yeah. that that reminds me of something from my life and i've told the story i'll tell it real quick is it me and my dad never communicated or got along but when i was going really crazy in my early 20s and i brought these weird people home my dad was like no you're not going to do this you know, you're not doing this. You're not bringing these people, especially around my grandchildren. And my mom is just like, I'm going to love this child. You know, that's what moms do. And dad yeah. set, the, set the rules and moms are like, I'm going to love you. You know, there's yeah. nothing wrong with that. <laughs> no, there's not. I mean, you need, you really need both. That's exactly. You, just, you really need both. Because exactly. you're, you know, some, you know, what's, you know, what's funny about this? You'll appreciate this. I was, uh. I was talking with Father Turbo about this one time. And Father Turbo, I said, man, I go, it's so funny. I was saying to him, you know, like we were talking and I said, you know, sometimes I really get on the boys. Like, hey, you all need to knock that off, whatever else, you know. Um, now, all of my relationship with them is like 90% love and affection and like 10% correction. Yeah. Right. So like it's. There's all the hugs, there's all the kisses, there's all the love, there's wow. all of that. And then there's discipline. When it's time to do discipline, wow. we're, we're doing discipline. Wow. But I said to, you know, I said to him, you know, I, I don't know, I was saying something to the boy, hey, you guys need to knock that off. And then my what does my wife do? She'll, it's all right, don't worry. She'll, they're fine. We'll just do da 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 da. And I'm like, man, I go, what do you, you know? I I I think I was even asking, what do you do when your wife is like trying to kind of get in the mix on that or whatever? And he goes, you're like, he goes, you're like Christ. And she's like the mother of God. Mm. And he's like, you're ready to bring the discipline. And she's like interceding for sinners, you know? Mm. I, I like that. I like and I that. was like, that's the dynamic. I mean, like, yeah. that's really the dynamic is like, you know, as a dad, you're like, hey, it's time. It's we're in discipline time. And, you know, just like the mother of God does for us, she's like, just give them a little bit more. Just give them a little bit more. Like. Like she's always, she's always, you know, we always say that too. Like at the moment of our death, she's the one who's interceding for us the most before her son, that he mm -hmm. would have mercy on us. We're her children, right? I mean, we're her children. She loves us. We're her children and we love her. She knows that we love her. So, I mean, like, it's just, it's interesting that you see that that dynamic is like, even in a marriage. Yeah. That's yeah. it's all there. Those two, and and the thing is, it's not the marriage; it's the masculine and the feminine energy, the, and 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 who we just are intrinsically. That's so beautiful. that's beautiful. Yeah, 
uh, effects of parental absence on male adolescents. Um, let's see, results indicate that father absent boys evidence a poor sense of masculinity as well as poor interpersonal relationships than do father present boys. Not good. Let's see, parental and interpersonal relationships of transsexual. Okay, now we're getting into the the heavy duty stuff. And masculine, feminine, homosexual men. It was found that the fathers of homosexuals and transsexuals were more hostile and less dominant than the fathers of the control group and hence less desirable identification models. It was found that the see it was found that the fathers of homosexual and transsexuals were more hostile and less dominant than the fathers of the hot yeah. It's all it all has to do with the family upbringing. Sex role stereotypes, gender identity, and parental relationships in male homosexuals and heterosexuals. Homosexual men perceive themselves as psychologically more distant from their fathers than did their heterosexual counterparts. Have you ever, have you ever, um, there you go. Uh, you ever seen those, that TikTok? I saw it through somebody else had posted it and it was a TikTok. I think it was, I think it was TikTok where you would get, they would get, a, uh, it was, um, uh, I can't remember what it was called, but it was like all, all, it was like a, a gay man quiz or whatever. And so what it would do is it would flash questions on the screen and the gay guy would have to answer yes mm. or no, whatever. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think I think it was actually gay man stereotype quiz. Mm. And the first question, this is what threw people. The first question was, you're not good at math. And I remember there was a there and there were somebody had compiled several of these clips of different gay men doing this. Mm -hmm. And the first clip was, you're not good at math. And the guy'd be like, that's totally false. Then the second question that would pop up was says, You don't have a close relationship with your father. <laughs> And then, and the guy would just look away, he'd just get defeated, right? And they did, it was like a trick, but they had done clips of multiple, and that's, you know, they've always said that that was the kind of the, um, was an absentee father or emotionally or physically absentee father and an overbearing mother. Exactly. Those two dynamics seem to create, um, obviously, and it's interesting, you know, I grew up in Southern California, so... I could see this, that there were gay men that I knew that were, that had like almost a revulsion towards women because on some level they were, they were revolting against their mom. Exactly. That's why, yeah. that's, that's why you see drag. Gay men do drag because it is, it, it is making fun of women. Oh. It's, it's caricaturing right. and, and lambasting women so <laughs> that's why they do it it's not it's not it's not a homage to women <laughs> that's wild i never thought about that like yeah. i never thought about that yeah because even even the way that it is it, even the way that it's done is over everything is over the top the colors yes. the outfits yeah. the hair it's it makes that, it makes, it makes women look ugly it's ugly you know Whoa, <laughs> that's wild, man. I didn't even, I didn't see that. Yeah. Yeah. It's. I it's, mean, women have picked that up. I've seen women online, you know, saying, well, look at what they're doing to this drag stuff. Look at how it makes women look. You know, women have picked that up. You know? No, no, yeah, it's grotesque. It's, yeah. it's grotesque. It isn't, it isn't subtle femininity. No. Oh. Yep. Do you think a lot, do you, I mean, obviously you've known lots of, of, of same sex attracted men. Do you think that they, they kind of tend to hate women or do you think that they're more revolted mm. by them, or what is that dynamic? Could be a little of both. I think, I mean, I think, I think it, at the heart of male homosexuality, it's a longing for the father mm. and, and it gets twisted 
into something sexual, you know, but it's also in that there's a revolt against women, you know, because it's an all male, it's an all male community, you know, so it's, it's both. So, mm. but, but, but a lot of gay men maintain strong relationships with their mothers, but their relationships are strange, you know, they're weird. Yeah. 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 Uh, they're not, they're, they're not normal and they have very odd relationships with their dad. If their dad is around, you know, I I've seen, it's not a hundred percent of the time. Cause then people will say, well, no, that's not true. But I mean, it's the majority. Yeah. yeah. You always have outliers, but yeah. 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 Let's see, let me click the next, Here we go. Paternal absence and sex role development, preschool, let me see if I can, oh, there we go. Let's see, uh, preschool father absent boys were shown to make less stereotypical churches choices of toys and activities when compared to father present age mates. When compared to father present boys, older father absent boys were more stereotypical in their overt behavior, but typically in terms of aggression. I thought that was interesting. So uh, the boys with the father absent, uh, as they get older, you know, are more stereotypical male and more aggressive. And you said that father. It's just, it's, it's interesting. Cause I, there's certain things I think that like, there's certain things with myself that my, my, uh, I, so my wife grew up with her mom and her sister and no dad. So her mm -hmm. dad was basically when she was like four years old. And then my wife basically moved out when she was 15 and went and lived with her best friend. And, uh, you know, so like left home, I think she was 15, maybe she was 14 even, but went and lived on her own with her best friend and, uh, her mom. So mm -hmm. she had like, she, I mean, obviously she had, boys around her in high school and whatever else but she was never raised in any kind of male environment you know and uh and uh so we're very very opposite super opposite ends of the spectrum in terms of personalities and everything else but we fit together very well uh we complement each other's weaknesses you know and uh i think that there's certain things that she thought were like me things mm. like like he's kind of He's kind of uh, hardwired a certain way. And then as she's had boys, because now mm -hmm. it's her and five, and me and five boys, right? And she's not, she's not a tomboy. She's just not, she's just, she's, mm -hmm. that's just, it's, she's just not that at all. And she wasn't even really raised around a man, right? So anyways, now she's seeing like, oh, some of this stuff is just intrinsic. Like this is like intrinsic. As you get older, male, male behavior. Yeah. Like this, this is when, and the other thing is too, the thing that she does really well is she lets them kind of be wild and a bit reckless mm -hmm. on the playground, whatever else, you know? So she, she really draws a line. Like if there's something immodest, you know, she is like really quick to get on it and like get their attention away or do whatever. Right. So she's, really big on the spiritual purity and their spiritual development, but then yeah. all of their kind of wild boyness, she just lets it, she's good. cool with all. Good. So she, I, I mean, she is a really good balance because, you know, sometimes I see her letting them do stuff at the park and I'm like, you're going to let them do that. And she's like, yeah, they do it all the time. Like, <laughs> all right. And I, and I realized like, she just letting them be boys. Yeah. Uh, but, but she's realized she, we, she made a joke this morning that uh, my my third son is having a birthday, and the fourth son, who's five years old this morning, she he said uh, they want to do I think like a Halo themed birthday party or something, the video game or something like this. And and mm. the, the fourth boy goes, Halo mask for the birthday. It's decided. And then she was like, we both looked at each other and kind of laughed, like he was like calling the shots, you know. She's like, oh, she's like, wow. She goes, alpha male number five has made the decision or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> like, like, like they just, they're like, they want to. And the other thing is too, like men want to get stuff done. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like it's natural and an inclination. 
there was a study done years ago, or I heard the story years ago about they gave a game to a group of women or gr group of girls. Uh, I think they were like 12 and under, whatever. It was a it was a game with no rules, and they had to figure out how to play it. And what they found was that the girls eventually, it, the game just evolved, and they broke into little, clicks. little clicks and then started <laughs> saying mean things about each other and whatever else and never finished the game. <laughs> and then they gave the game to the boys, and the boys, like, through arguing, I think they got into a fight or something like that, whatever else, they established all of the rules and like they had to finish the game. <laughs> and it's so funny too. Like if you watch little boys, when they get to the park, like for a nerf, they'll show up to the park. They will argue with other boys for five minutes, 10 minutes. Sometimes this is not a joke about all the rules. Yeah. And then they'll start playing. I remember that. They have to establish all of the boundaries and the hierarchy of what they're doing and what are the rules before they commence to even play the game. It's just a totally different dynamic. So, anyways. No, you're we right. We're that our little guy today. Yeah, he's like, this is what we're doing. This is how we're doing it. Yeah. Like, but the, right. Yeah, this, this, no, this study supports what you're saying, which is there's a biological role to uh, masculine and feminine because the, the preschool boys in this group, you know, probably uh, follow, it's it's more nurture, followed what their dad did or choices. But when you get older, it kicks in anyway, even if they don't have a, a father at home. Well, it's interesting too. Like even, again, this is just anecdotal of what we've yeah. observed. It, almost every boy has been very close and, and clingy to my wife until the age of three or four. Yeah. And then they start to move like they love their mom, but it's like they have a natural inclination towards dad. Like it, it's, I, I've even seen it with little kids, like little boys. They're just really not that interested in you as your, as their dad. Yeah. Like they're kind of like, you're, you're okay. You're here. You're the dad, but like, yeah, it's like, you're not feeding me. You're not nurturing me. You're not sleeping with me. You're not cuddling me all the time. It's just, you're just not that important, yeah. you know? And then it's so interesting at like three or four, there's like a mark shift and you can see it. Yeah. And then all of a sudden they're like, I'm all about dad. Yeah. Like I need, I need a, I need my dad. And the problems arise if the dad rejects the kid or the dad's not there. Yeah. Yeah. Then you got yeah, problems. And, and I should say, too, all of yeah. my boys, there's so much difference. You know, I probably, you, you know what I mean? It isn't, they're not all one personality. Like, you, no, you know what no, I'm saying? No. I've got a kid who's like super artistic, like super artistic. I got another one who's a little brainiac, another one who's kind of like a salesman lawyer. Like the wow. personalities are wildly different. Um, it, but, but they need that affirmation. And that and and to figure out who they are, and I even think you know it's interesting, Joseph. I don't really talk a lot about this, or not, maybe I've never talked about this before. But they they get a sense of defining who they are by who their dad is. So mm. even when we're watching a show, this is not like we'll mm. watch a show or something will be on or something, and they'll see somebody, they'll see a man who's like big and strong, and they'll go, "Dad, are you stronger than him?" <laughs> And they want to know, like, they want to know, and it's weird because they're not stronger than them, but, like, my dad is, my dad is on this hierarchy with other men, and they, and they draw, they draw, like, some of their kind of, like, meaning or, or definition of who they are from, like, who's my dad? Who is my dad? What is he about? What is he like? Which is, which is interesting because... Everything with Christ in the gospel is mm. to do the will of the Father. Yeah. Christ doesn't really reference himself very much. He references doing the Father's will. Mm. So much of Christ and his ministry is defined by what does the Father want me to do and how does he want me to do it, and that's what I'm here to do. So mm. it's interesting because even in our lives now as men, like I don't have a I don't have a proper father figure. My, you know, I'm not. I, I don't, um, 
I have maybe one friend who's kind of an older brother mentor type to me that I'm very close with. And I love dearly, but he's not a father. I'm like, what's the difference? I'm like, you really transition into God being your father. Mm -hmm. You you have to make that's you it. have to make that that correlation. Okay. That's it. Kind of boyhood to manhood and transition into into having a purpose and a meaning that comes from God. In that's a lot it. of ways, it's interesting, Joseph, because you were asking earlier about father figures. And in my whole life, in my mid twenties, I, I had a mentor um, mm. who really showed me a lot about what it was meant to be a man, but he was just old enough that he was more like an older brother. I mm. think he's, he's like 13 years older than me. So he's not old enough to be a, a father figure, but he's old enough that he was able to really guide me through a lot of stuff in my marriage and life. Oh. And we're still very close. I mean, we've been super close um for years um but in a weird way i'm always grateful that i didn't have a father figure because it actually i think it gave me a lot of it gave me a lot of uh rocket fuel in my in my spiritual kind of mm -hmm. rock journey like it fueled me to want to find that fatherly relationship with god mm -hmm. So what's interesting is like I, when I was young and into my early twenties, I was very upset and disappointed that I never had a father figure. I bet. And then I think yeah. as I really got into my thirties, I mm. I actually became grateful because it it made me drive and push mm. that much harder into into God and into discovering who He was, mm. and like knowing Him personally, not just about Him. But I wanted to know him. I wanted to experience him. I wanted to feel close and loved by him. And 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 the hardest thing or the scariest thing about that is like you're putting all of yourself out there for the invisible God. Mm. And like and 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 is he going to show up? Mm. In that in that quote from in that quote from uh, Fight Club, uh, uh, where he says, I think it's Tyler Durden says. Our fathers are our yes. role for yes. God. If our yes. fathers didn't want us, I know what very well. Tell us about God. And the interesting thing is, like, it doesn't tell us anything about God because mm. God is not like our fathers. Like, no. He's intensely interpersonal and loves us and desires to be with us in the most intimate, closest relationship yeah. that we will ever have. It's interesting that Chuck, I can never pronounce his last name, Chuck Pol Polniak. You know, yeah, that, Palinuk, yeah. Palinuk, they wrote that book. He's he's gay. So yeah. he he gets it. <laughs> it's no, it's one he, it's one of my favorite books. You ever read uh you ever see him on on Joe Rogan when he did the interview on Joe Rogan? I, I might have, I don't recall. Oh, uh, you should see it's it's it, there's some times on there, there's a time on there where he's talking to Joe. And Joe's like, well, you're a good guy. And he like dead honest is looking at Joe and he's like, I know I'm not a good person. Mm. And he had this like this super intense sincerity. And he's like, Joe, you're not going to be able to convince me. Basically. He's like, I, I know who I am. And it's like, it's kind of a little, a little dark, but also a little revealing. Like he's very humble about it. Like he doesn't, he's like, I have no pretense that I'm a good person. Mm. Anyways, it's it's an interesting interview. Like it's it, it's worth watching. It's worth okay. watching for sure. From what I remember, somebody go back and watch it and be like, "Oh, there's terrible things in there." I just oh. the, the things that I remember from it were very good. Okay, but I, I like the book. It's very it's it's very uh, telling. Th this was interesting, Father. Associations between father absence and age of first sexual intercourse. Um, Father absent children were more likely to report having had sexual intercourse than father present children. 63% of children whose fathers were always absent reported having had sexual intercourse compared to 52% of children whose fathers were partially absent. And only 21% of children whose fathers were always present. Man, that's crazy. This was interesting. A similar pattern was evident when considering males and females separately. That surprised me because I, I would understand, I knew a lot of women who had bad dads or absent dads or abusive dads, and a number of them turned out to be promiscuous. 
I always thought they were looking for a father figure, but this is also true with men. Wow. <laughs> well, male attention for women. It's interesting that we get two different things. Men and women are looking for two different things from their fathers. There, there's correlations, but they're not the same. Yeah. But male attention um, for a woman is like, they people say is like oxygen. Yeah. And so if she can't get good male attention and affirmation. She's willing to settle for any. Yeah. And if it's and if it's an exchange for basically sexual performance, yeah. she's willing to do that in order to get the attention that she's longing for. Yeah. And I think if boys aren't modeled a good male female relationship in their parents, I think boys sometimes will grow up to use women. So they of course they'll have more sex more and more or and earlier. So because they don't know how to treat women. That's what it is. Well, they're yeah. also they're also mimicking they're also mimicking the the poor behavior that they've that their fathers yeah. have mothers, right? Ex exactly, father. This is does father absence place daughters at special risk for early sexual activity and teenage pregnancy? Greater exposure to father absence was strongly associated with elegant elevated risk for early sexual activity and adolescent pregnancy. Every problem. Men's childhood sexual abuse, this is important. Men's childhood sexual abuse histories by one parent versus two parent status of childhood home. Let's see, sexually abused males often come from childhood homes without two married biological parents present. These children may have higher emotional needs that lead them to seek out attention and affection from non-parent adults, which they do in environments that are conducive to being exposed to exploitative adults who can take advantage of the children's attention-seeking and affection-seeking needs. Well, this is my story, why I got abused by a Catholic priest. And I'm not blaming the victim, but I think it's what you were talking about, Father, too, is that when there's a father absent and there's a real, a, another like male figure in the home, either through the parent or whatever, or the boy is, is feeling alienated or in need of, of father affirmation, it makes you vulnerable to predators. So, well, and and kids, you know, obviously, kids don't have a sense of this. No. So they assume they assume that the male figures around them are are safe and trustworthy and and whatever else. There's a naivety that that these that there are these people around who are who are um, really evil, and uh, I think that's why a lot of a lot of men who get abused they struggle with what does it say about me. Mm -hmm. And it, it doesn't say anything about you. It's not reflective of you at all. Oh, these, people you. Are, these people are predators and they're evil. They're demonic. It's a real evil and, and demonic and it has it doesn't reflect on you at all. You're young and naive and, un, and, and, un, and, un, and unformed. Like it doesn't say anything about you. It's not you. Yeah. You know what I mean? Thank you for saying that, Father. But the But the scary thing in our culture right now is... 58%, I found this one study, 58% of male adolescents who later became same-sex attracted suffered sexual abuse as children. So these kids that are sexually abused as kids later, people tell them, oh, you're gay. Isn't that nice? Instead of saying what you said, now I found this on a uh, LGBT website. I thought it was sad hmm. but what does this say about what these men are looking for it was from this website photos gay daddies and their sons together on father's day and this was the picture they had ay, ay, ay. This kind of brought me full circle, Father. And I think you talked, you hit this earlier when you were talking about the Chuck, uh, the Chuck Polniak book, uh, 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 Fight Club, about um, uh, fa God reflecting men's ideas of their fathers. So, an important um, parable to me in the Bible and scripture is the prodigal son. 
and and I've written about it a million times. I love it. And I found this icon. So here you got, and I don't, I'm not an expert on icons. You probably know more than me, Father. But he, here you got the prodigal son when he was in his sin and he's with the pigs and everything. But here's the prodigal son when he's rejoined with his father. But look at the way they depicted the, the father. I mean, it's Jesus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I thought that was pretty I thought that was pretty awesome. So I think you hit it father on the nail. I was going to say when you were talking earlier that you you summed up this conversation because I think you know if you if you didn't if you've got a lousy father an abusive father your dad wasn't around you always have a father in heaven and I think this icon showed it where the father of the prodigal son is actually you know, Christ himself. So. Yeah, I think it was in the writings of St. Porfirios, he says, we know Christ kind of in three ways. And, and he says, we know him as our father. We know him as our brother. And then we also know him as our friend. Mm -hmm. And it, 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 and it's interesting because we know him, but he is, he is the exact representation as he says of the father, right? If you've seen me, you've seen the father, mm -hmm. but like, we know Christ as our father. Yeah. Could, could you give just real quick, Father, at the end, I know I, I give, I do sort of these open-ended questions that are kind of tough. They're, they're overly broad, but I mean, where's a good way for, for men to start healing from what I call the father wound? Cause that, that's what interested me in, in talking to you is that I think there's a lot of guys out there that either are having trouble with their identity or with anger or, uh, you know, they, they can't connect with women or because of that, they're getting involved with pornography and stuff. And I, I think a lot of it has to do with the way they were raised, that they weren't really, mo they didn't really get modeled good masculine attributes by their father. Maybe their dad did the best they could. And, I, and I've seen this a lot too, that a lot of dads weren't necessarily bad guys or they weren't violent or they weren't abusive or they were around but they didn't they didn't have dads that were involved in their lives so they really didn't know how to be a father themselves so it wasn't like malice they just didn't know what they were doing so i mean where's a good place for men to to start to try to heal those old wounds because i think without doing that they're not going to have a good relationship with God. They're not going to heal. They're not going to meet good, healthy women. They're just they're just going to be stuck where they are. Yeah, I, two things I think are very, well, we should say three things that I think are fundamental. Number one is you have to have compassion on your father. Oh, yeah, father. Very good. You, you've got to see you got to see where he came from and what he came from. You know, my dad came from a very abusive Wow. With his own father. So my, so my dad's father. So did my dad father. Yeah. So he and, was. And, and I didn't, don't mean to interrupt you, but you, what you're saying oh. is real important because I didn't find that out too much later. Cause I always thought growing up, my dad was an SOB, but then from his sister, I found out how really horrible their childhood was and everything kind of clicked in my head i go oh i get it okay go ahead father sorry no no i mean that's number one is to realize like somebody somebody when you meet somebody who is malformed it, it, it's right it, there's a reason they're malformed so you when you start to peel back yeah. the stuff that happens in your in your family's life and in your in, with your grandparents or great-grandparents yeah. you realize there's like a lot of trauma there that was traumatic for them. And so my yeah. dad's relationship with his own father was very traumatic. His own childhood was very traumatic. He never healed from it. He never mm -hmm. healed. So everything that no. he did came out of that, which is the irony, right? Which is that if you don't forgive, you become like the people that you don't forgive. Wow. So number one is number one is like, you don't, you, you, it's not just that you have to forgive them. You have to beg God to help you to forgive them so that you are totally, utterly, and completely done with any bitterness or resentment or justification for any anger. Like, whatever that takes, however many prostrations and prayers 
and begging Christ, you have to just, to the point where you don't feel anything towards the person. As if it never happened. As if it never happened. Like, if you mention my dad, I don't feel any animosity. I don't I don't have any animosity. I don't have any unforgiveness. As You know, as far as I can see, as God is my witness, like, it's just not there. Like, if anything, I feel sorry for the person. I feel mm. sorry for him. Mm. That's number one. Like, that work has to be done, no matter how. And I mean, and the thing is, when you get to that level of forgiveness, you, one, you can't do it on your own. So I really mean that when I talk about doing prostrations every night for the person, praying, begging God to help you, begging God to give you forgiveness, and that you will not, like, if he takes away that unforgiveness, you will not pick it up as a resentment or a bitterness or a justification at all. So I don't ever talk about my childhood like I'm a victim. I It is what it is, and it's over with, and now I'm an adult. You know, and that's number one. That's the most important thing. Number two is don't make your priest your your father figure. Mm. Don't make your priest your father figure. Mm. Have a relationship, have a spiritual father, which is a priestly relationship, but don't try to make somebody your father. Yeah. I don't can. try to don't try to supplement what's gone is gone. Don't try to supplement it with somebody else. It's not. It's yeah. not really fair to them, and it's not really fair to you. Nobody yeah. is ever going to, whatever that dynamic is between a, a father and a son, you're never going to replace it with anybody else. Yeah, it's I did that. It, it is. It just is. You know what I mean? It just is. It's not, you know, even I said my friend who I'm very close with, who's like an older brother figure to me, he's not my father. Fit. You can't get that. That can only happen with a father. You get one shot at it, and it, you either get it or you don't. Yep. And some of us didn't get it. And, you know, some other people get other things in life that are much worse than ours. It is what it is. You know what I mean? So I don't, I don't, I don't bemoan or bewail it. I mean, because I, because when I got into my twenties, I realized I had all this bitterness, resentment, unforgiveness, and all these other things that I was harboring inside of myself. And I was like, you're a grown man. And now you got to get on with your life, you know? And that's what it, it just is what it is. There's nothing, there's no, rationality that can make you feel better about it it's just gone that childhood is gone the ship sailed you didn't get it it is what it is and now you know i've got work to do as a man and i'm just not going to hold on to that because it's gone nothing i can do about it nothing i can do to bring it back i can't replace it i can't replace my dad i can't replace my childhood um that's it it is what it is uh you know i fully understand you know it's it's a weird, it's a weird experience. I feel, I feel like I want to share it, which is, you know, sometimes when I, uh, I frequently, when I put my boys down to bed, so I got uh, the, I got the olders and the little, so two older, two little, and then a baby. So that when I put the two olders, two littles to bed, whatever, but a lot of times frequently I get a lot of like, you're the best dad ever, you oh. know, and all these things. Right. And these Sweet. intense hugs from them. Right. This mm -hmm. like, it's, and there's part of me, It, the thing is, I go, look, I didn't get this, but I'm very grateful that I get to give it. Mm, it's beautiful. So I, I like, I'm very grateful for the fact that like, it, whatever happened in my family with all the abuse and the trauma and all that, it doesn't, it isn't, I'm not passing it on. Thank God. You know what I mean? Yeah. So there's a weird, there's kind of like a bitter, it's a bittersweet experience. It's kind of bittersweet because you know that they they experience what you've never experienced. I didn't experience that. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't I didn't I didn't want, you know, I didn't want to crawl out of bed and and wrap my arms around papa at bedtime mm -hmm. and hug him mm -hmm. and be close to him and you know whatever else and and have that. But I get to give it to them. As, cool. And they you know, and I love them. They're my favorite people. So like in a weird way, there's something redemptive about it. It's, I can't say it's painful, but it's bittersweet, like I said. It's bittersweet. It's like, you know what? I, yeah, I'll never go back and get my childhood, but like, I'm super grateful that my sons have a dad that they know is yeah. crazy about them and loves them. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. You know?
And then the third thing I was going to say is you got to say the Jesus prayer and you got to find Christ as your father. And that's number two, by trying, by not making a priest or somebody else, your, your supplemental father, you create space to have Christ mm -hmm. as your father. So the priest is wonderful, right? I love being a, most of the time, I love being a priest and, I, you know, <laughs> I have good relationship with parishioners or spiritual children, however you want to call them, you know, but mm -hmm. I've seen it in people where sometimes they want you to be their um. supplemental father figure. And you, and you're like, I can love you with my whole heart, but I, it will, I won't replace what was lost. That's an intangible. Like I can love you very much, but there's a tangible, but you've got it. And it just is what it is. Cause I'm in the same boat as everybody else, but what you got to do is you got to find Christ as your father. That's the, that is, so those steps are, are important in that order because part of forgiving your father is that you're going to find Christ through that healing process. And part of not trying to make another man, your, your replacement father figure is going to give you the space to have more intimacy with Christ. So it's kind of like, it's kind of like, you know, when you're, when you're married, you don't have any friends of the opposite sex. You only share that with your wife, that dynamic, that male, female dynamic friendship. I'm friendly with lots of women. I talk with lots of women. Obviously a priest, I talk with lots of women, but they're not my friends. They're more, they're my spiritual daughters. You know, it's a different dynamic, but with my wife, that's my friend. Yep. There's a friend, there's a, there's a, there's a closeness, there. and I don't even want to say like we're not best friends. That's not proper for a husband to be the be his wife to be his best friend. That's that's weird. I'm her husband, but there's a friendship and a closeness yeah. there that I don't have with the other woman, you know. And so, but I have it there, and it's special and unique because I don't have it anywhere else. So my relationship with Christ is unique and special because I don't have it with anybody else. So, and I'm not trying to put anybody. Mm. I'm not trying. I'm not trying to fill in where Christ needs to be with somebody else. Right. So. Right. Thank, th th thank you, Father. I wanted to just say thank you for, for taking the time. And then everybody listening, please take what Father says to heart, because I think what he said is very profound and it's very important. And it's never too late to start working on these things. So, I mean, I you know, I have a lot of friends who say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm too old. I've been in this life or that for too long. But, you know, I was, I was received into the Orthodox church and I was uh, 53 years old. So it's never too late. <laughs> Thank you, Father, so much. God bless you. Could, could you give, uh, offer a, a, a prayer or a blessing to myself and but we'll talk into you as a blessing but to myself and and anybody listening yeah we'll do we'll do uh the outro prayer to the mother of god okay it is truly me to bless the oath Theotokos, ever blessed and most pure and the mother of our god more honorable than the cherubim and beyond compare more glorious than the seraphim who without corruption gave us birth to god the word the very Theotokos, be to be magnified i mean Is that it, Father? That's it, man. I got nothing. <laughs> that was a lot. Thank you, Father. God bless you. Thank you again for taking the, so much time to speak um, with me.